just want to start by saying thanks to Dr. Grant, conference organizers, for allowing me to come and speak today. Um, I am at Washington University, as Dr. George said, and um, helped to run something called the Park Reeves Syringomyelia Research Consortium. So today is a little bit different. What I'm going to speak to you about is a little bit different uh, in that I'm not going to present any results because we don't have any yet. Um, instead, I'm going to present, uh, present a little bit about the study that we're running, the major study we're running, and kind of let everybody know a little bit about it. Um, I do have some disclosures. Um, I have research funding, which includes funding through Medtronic and Carl Storrs. Um, and this is just for unrelated basic science research, um, not something I'm going to cover today. I do have some funding through uh, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI. Um, PCORI was uh, an agency formed through the Affordable Care Act and uh, funds a lot of the research that I'm going to tell you about. The thing about PCORI is that it's patient-centered outcomes, and because of that, they really like to have a lot of interplay between the patients, families, and what they call stakeholders. And stakeholders are really the physicians, clinicians, and other personnel that uh, participate and benefit from the research. So PCORI really likes us to come and talk to advocacy groups and patients and things like this. So, I really, you'll see this at the end, but I really would welcome any input that you all have uh, with respect to the, the research that we're gonna talk about. And then I did, I was fortunate enough to get some funding through um, ASAP back in 2014. Um, and uh, much of what I'm gonna present today, the PCORI grant, this multi-institutional data, uh, is based on the findings from that one-year grant back in 2014. So, want to say thanks to the organization for that. So again, the other thing I was very fortunate uh, to have is uh, a medical student who took a year off to do research with me, and he was enormously productive with this uh, funding that you guys generously provided. In one year, he wrote six papers, um, which is you know an overwhelming amount of productivity. Uh, and uh, again, it really forms the basis of what I'll be talking about. And what Jacob Greenberg, this student, did was he said, OK, I would like to know if I can predict when a patient comes through the door with Chiari and Syringomyelia, how they're going to do at the end. What's their outcome going to be? Can we identify that ahead of time? And I thought that was a great idea. And that's what ASAP funded us to do. And the first thing he did is he sort of went through and did a systematic review of how we judge outcomes in Chiari and Syringomyelia. And what he found was really interesting. So uh, this is a slide from that paper. And I don't know how well it, pro it projects, but essentially what he found was the vast majority of papers that are out there from the scientific literature judged outcome on whether the physician's gestalt. What, what was the physician's gestalt? Did I think the patient did better, or did I think they didn't do as well? Um, now, physician gestalt probably has some value, but it's not really something you can quantify. And we as physicians always have bias. Uh, we always think we're the best, and we always think our patients do the best. But we really don't have any idea if that's really the case or not. So to use physician gestalt as the main outcome metric seems a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, In addition to physician gestalt, very few uh, papers use standardized scales or even went so far as to describe things like, did the headaches improve? Again, it was just sort of, do I think these patients got better or not? And a very, very small percentage of the papers had any sort of scale that was applied that was relevant to the disease of interest, which in this case was Chiari and Syringomyelia. So the first thing he identified was that our outcome tools were not great. But with that in mind, he created a survey uh, to actually give to patients who ultimately are the arbiters of whether somebody does well or not. And this was sort of a novel concept. And what he did was he went through and identified clinical parameters, what kind of headaches you have. Did you have what we call myelopathic symptoms, which would be like spinal cord related symptoms, numbness, and things like that. Um, and then radiographic findings and said, can we identify a set of parameters that predict how people do? And he did these two really advanced statistical techniques called um, sequ sequential sequestration and conjunctive consolidation and came up with this uh, set of uh, parameters that help us to understand when people are likely to do well after uh, Chiari and 
Chiari syringe ilia surgery. So this is the Chiari severity index, and it really distills down um, to if you do, and we've heard a little bit about this, if you have occipital headaches, you really have a great profile for improving from, uh, from Chiari decompression surgery. Your odds of improving are somewhere in the range of 80 plus percent. That's not to say if your headaches are not occipital that you won't derive benefit from surgery, but your odds of getting what you as patients say are benefits from surgery are lower than if you had occipital headaches and neck pain, for example. Those patients that have numbness and tingling are less likely to have an improvement in numbness and tingling after surgery. And uh, searing size seemed to be the most important radiographic parameter um, to help us understand what your outcome might be. Jacob also went through and with the support of ASAP uh, looked at um, outcomes not just at one institution or two institutions but across entire populations. So what he did is he used administrative billing data from California, Florida, and New York to say, okay, those are big states. There are a lot of patients being treated. Can we get any information from these um, sort of uh, these big scale databases in order to understand what outcomes will be like? And this paper was um, quoted by Dr. George before. And um, again, he sort of went through um, some of the main conclusions, but basically surgical complications occur after Chiari surgery. Not surprised there, but they don't all happen within the first day or a couple days or even weeks after surgery. They can come up as late as uh, three months after surgery, and that's what you see on the left panel there as they acquire, they kind of accumulate over time. And medical complications can occur, but they don't seem to occur as frequently, and they happen right at the time of surgery and then aren't likely to increase over time after that. Not surprisingly, those complications that were observed in these large population-based databases were um, likely to, to cerebrospinal fluid uh, hydrodynamics like CSF leak, pseudomeningocele, and many of those other things that we've been talking about along the way today. Of course, one of the biggest questions, probably the most controversial question in pediatric neurosurgery at least, is when you're doing a posterior fossa decompression, whether or not to open the dura and perform a duraplasty. And I know you are all well aware of this question, uh, and we've heard a lot about it today already. And so um, in Park Reeves, which is a 36 center collaborative effort, we said, what question is the most important to answer with this large collaborative that we have? And all our investigators felt like trying to put that question to rest. Do we open the dura or do we do an extradural decompression was probably one of the most important questions we could address as a team. Um, now, this we weren't the first to pose that question. Like I said, it's a controversial question. There have been individual papers, which are all summarized here in this slide, and then a meta-analysis, which is this, uh, this particular slide that I'm showing from Dr. Durham's group. Um, and the one thing that comes up here is that, not surprisingly, um, the complication rate related to cerebrospinal fluid uh, uh, problems like CSF leak and pseudomeningocele tend to be higher in those groups where, in those patients where we do a duraplasty. But it looks like maybe the rate for reoperation, meaning a failed decompression or a needing a, re a re revision decompression, is higher in that group uh, of patients who don't have the duraplasty. So that really leaves us and really just sort of further uh, embroils us in, in this controversy. And if we look at the data, and I know this won't show up too well, but the, if we look at the data that comes out of Park Reeves, which is now over 1,200 patients, at this time when I did this analysis, this was, I believe, 583 patients, but still a really large group of patients who both had Chiari and syringomyelia. The data are remarkably consistent. So in that DERM meta-analysis, the risk of complications were 18%. In Park Reeves, we found it was 17.5%, so really consistent. And the rate of uh, revision surgery was not surprisingly higher if we didn't do a duroplasty. So again, these are sort of um, just further uh, solidifying our, our hunches as uh, physicians and clinical researchers. So, um, so what, what's the question here? Why, why is it that when we do a duroplasty, we see higher complications and, and if we don't, we don't see 
quite the efficacy. Is this question a relevant question, and how does that affect quality of life? This, this is the major question that I'm going to talk to you about today. And really, in order to ask that question, we, we submitted a grant to the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and they awarded us $2.75 million. Uh, the study was um, endorsed by the AANS, the CNS, and the Joint Section for Pediatrics. Um, but PCORI, like I mentioned, really likes us to involve patients and patients' families and stakeholders. So on the grant, it's not just the researchers of Park Reeves. There are uh, a, a cohort of 10 patient partners uh, of parents of, uh, of children who've uh, sustained and suffered through this illness. Um, and then we have nurse practitioners and neurologists and therapists and, and various other uh, stakeholders uh, that participate as well. And what we did is we designed a cluster randomized control trial. And I'll talk about that cluster aspect in just a second, but a randomized control trial uh, comparing these two. And uh, it involves 47 centers across the United States. Uh, the original 36 Park Reef centers, and then we added 11 centers. And really, so why would we do this? You know, what we're trying to do is identify which of these surgical treatments minimizes surgical complications and harm to patients. Uh, and maximizes symptomatic relief and resolution of syrinx. But most importantly, and this is the third aim, is which provides a higher quality of life. Because there's no level one data, which is how we classify data as the best data to help us as clinicians help you as families to make good decisions for your children in this case. And this is again a paradigm shift away from individual reports where, you know, I'm a neurosurgeon, I feel like what I do is the best, um, to saying, okay, let's see what the best quality data we can generate is and see with all things being equal, if we can make a conclusion about which of these operations is the most effective, which harms patients the least, and which provides the best quality of life. Now, in order to look at quality of life, I mentioned before, there really aren't, or there weren't any good quality of life metrics. So. Um, we began to use something called the CHIP, the Chiardi Health Index in Pediatrics, uh, which was generated by Dr. Shevis Shannon and Jay Wellens in Vanderbilt. So for this, for this randomized control trial, uh, AIM-1, there are three specific aims. AIM-1 is to determine if posterior fossidy compression without the duraplasty is associated with fewer surgical complications. Now, we think that that's probably the case. Uh, all the data that we have suggests that's the case. Um, we also, as an AIM-2, wanted to determine if it provides non-inferior. Now, that's sort of statistical mumbo-jumbo. There are different levels of, of evidence. We can have non-inferior, equivalent, or superior, and how these clinical trials are done are very complicated. But what we wanted to determine is, was duraplasty, or, or was not doing a duraplasty not inferior? It's like a double negative, not inferior to doing the duraplasty. And then the third aim was to look at this quality of life. And in order to look at that, again, we used this Chiari Health Index in Pediatrics. And uh, this came out um, last year, uh, although just in print this year. Uh, and this is a 45-question uh, instrument that helps you, as family members, judge over time whether or not quality of life is improving. And you know, that's not as simple as it sounds, because quality of life involves pain, Pain severity, you can see here in the colors to the right there. Uh, pain severity, pain frequency, uh, but also non-pain syndrome uh, symptoms like, for example, is your balance off? Do you have tinnitus or buzzing in your ears? Um, do you feel like you don't have great use of your hands? And then psychosocial metrics as well, or psychosocial elements. For example, does your child feel anxious? Uh, do they fear, do they have fear, or are they able to make friends in, a, in an appropriate way or age-appropriate way. And so what it does is, is it takes these 45 different uh, fields and helps us to dis distill it down to whether or not quality of life is improved or not. And again, it's complicated, uh, but this scale has been validated now and um, is something that we're using to help us understand which of these operations might be best for any individual patient. And it turns out that when we originally proposed the grant, um, we had uh, 50 or so investigators, and we all agreed on the protocol, and it seemed like everything was rolling out uh, nicely, and then a handful of investigators asked the question, well, if we restrict syrinx size, 
uh, from three to six millimeters, for example, is that really going to be generalizable to everyone out there with a syrinx? And that was, a, I thought, a very valid question. On the other hand, we felt like neurosurgeons are not necessarily going to want to randomize patients with the largest of syrinx sizes because um, I, many surgeons feel like at the largest of syrinx sizes, it's worth doing the duraplasty. So we were sort of trying to walk that line of whether can we generalize our results to everyone and can we have what we call clinical equipoise when a clinician might say, well, I could see either one working. Um, so in the end, after a series of surveys that we, that we performed, we settled on a searing size of three to nine millimeters, uh, three being the lower end because there are many things uh, that we call dilated central cords, uh, dilated central canals, which may or may not be uh, syringes, um, and up to 10 millimeters, so just below 10 millimeters. So the, the inclusion criteria are three to, to uh, nine millimeters. And um, the Chiari, we use this uh, arbitrary uh, five millimeter um, uh, cutoff for tonsillar ectopia. Uh, whether that is the exact correct um, uh, measurement or not, I know is very controversial, but this is as a group what we settled was a reasonable way to, to, to run this trial. And then age less than 21. So ex exclusion criteria were those people with syrinx size greater than uh, 10, 10 millimeters or greater. Uh, we also didn't want to include people with basilar invagination or acute angles of the craniovertebral junction, which you heard about from Dr. Delohi earlier. Um, and then, of course, we excluded people who had had previous surgery and anyone who didn't want to participate. So let's come back to this cluster RCT. So a cluster RCT is a little bit different than other randomized controlled trials. Most randomized controlled trials, if you as a family decide to participate, you come in and um, the surgeon says, we're essentially going to use a computer program to flip a coin. If you get one or the other, you get one operation or the other. And we just felt like surgeon bias um, was at such a high level that it would be easier to randomize per hospital. So that's the cluster. So every hospital, each of the 47 hospitals, is, uh, has been sort of charged with recruiting six patients. And for those six patients, um, when the patients um, decide to participate, would be uh, put in one category or the other in terms of the operation. Now, of course, if there are real reasons, biological reasons, radiological reasons, that one might be preferable over the other, we don't randomize those patients. If a family doesn't want to be randomized, we, of course, don't randomize those patients. Um, and um, we treat patients the same no matter what outside of surgery. So they get the exact same examinations. Uh, they meet with a physician the exact same number of times. They get scans on the scheduled basis they would normally get. Um, and we collect data, including that Chiari, Chiari Health Index in pediatrics. This just sort of shows the workflow of the study. Um, again, screening and enrollment all the way through surgery and then follow up in three different time points um, to a year. And surgeons uh, that participate, and this does include almost 60% of the surgeons in the United States, um, and uh, surgeons have to have a certain um, uh, uh, training background in order to participate. They have to have done five in the last year, either operation or 20 in their career. Um, and um, of course, the operation itself is the way that we've all been taught to do it. We go in and do a craniectomy like was what was showed earlier. Um, and then we release that um, atlanto-occipital membrane, which is that fibrous band that was discussed. And from there, that's either the end of the posterior fossa decompression, or if you're in the duraplasty category, we open the dura uh, and um, put a dural graft in, and the type of dural graft and anything that's done inside uh, the dura from tonsillar shrinkage or other manipulations or maneuvers are up to the surgeon. Of course, the primary outcome is what uh, PCORI calls harm to patients, which is what we would call surgical complications. Uh, cerebrospinal fluid leak, any sort of uh, vascular injury that could result in a stroke, for example, uh, any neurological injury, um, or a pseudomeningocele. 
Um, the secondary, al secondary outcomes focus not on harms and harm and complications, but on effectiveness of surgery. So uh, we look at clinical symptoms and we look at neurological deficits. Searing size is one of the major secondary outcomes. And then spinal alignment and spinal deformity. Need for uh, repeat surgery obviously is a very unambiguous um, uh, point that we will be monitoring. And then most importantly, quality of life, like I've mentioned now a couple times. The outcomes will be adjudicated by a committee of pediatric neurosurgeons and neuroradiologists, uh, and they'll all be blinded to the study. And the data is collected in the Park Reeves platform, which already exists, um, and the data is all reviewed, uh, archived online, and reviewed by a central neuroradiologist. Everything is strictly reviewed. The data is monitored by a person whose job is just to sit around and check and make sure the data are as high quality as possible. Uh, and we have a safety monitoring board, a data, data safety monitoring board, which is designed to help us uh, rigorously um, uh, ensure that patient safety is maintained um, and that uh, from an ethical standpoint that we're not in any sort of ethical quandary as we administer the trial. So there's a bioethicist uh, involved as well. Right now, uh, we're enrolling at a number of centers um, with 47 different hospitals involved. You can imagine different hospitals are at different uh, steps in terms of getting approvals. Um, and uh, so we're enrolling right now at three hospitals. We just came on board on the first one in the end of May. Uh, about 11 more are within a week or so of being en enrolling, and then uh, the other uh, 25 or so are sort of coming on board uh, uh, over the next several months. Um, and right now there is a PEDSnet, which is a PCORI-based uh, research, and um, IRB, which is the Institutional Review Board that's helping us to expedite these, um, these approvals. So I'm actually going to stop there. Again, you know, I, I'm not here to present data, but to get feedback from you all. And um, I would welcome any feedback, whether now or offline, um, whatever, it's up to you, however you feel like um, uh, talking to me. And I can see one, one question there. I'm just curious, do you um, take into account the type of um, dura patch? Yeah, of course. So um, we we have not we have not gotten to analyze our results yet in um, Park Reeves, but again, there are 1,200 uh, patients, and one of the factors that we're looking at now is the different uh, dural patches. That's a great question, and we don't enforce that any uh, physician uses any patch other than what they would normally use, uh, and and but we are tracking it prospectively. Yeah, thanks. Yes, sir. Are any of the veteran hospitals surveys? You know, this is actually just a pediatric study, so, so none of the VA hospitals are involved. I think that um, it is definitely worthwhile to consider doing this in a larger population. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon, so um, that hasn't been my, my specific area, but I think that's definitely worth doing. You know, I've presented this at, at meetings before, a lot like this, and so many people come up to me afterwards and they say, you know what, my child had the CSF leak, had the infection, and you know, um, went on to need a fusion surgery and all these things. And um, you know, did did my child need all that? And I, I have no idea. You know, I'm I'm totally uh, I'm not biased by this. I'm just here to try to help provide that data. Uh, and the big charge for the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute is not to decide which is better, but to put that information in the hands of the patient. So you can say, well, you know, I understand the risk of a CSF leak is this. The risk of you know, a surgery is this, and I think this is better for me. And that's all we're trying to do. Uh, but I think the other thing that's nice is we're going to give quality of life information, which is a totally novel aspect. All right, well, thanks very, very much for your attention.